What's going on guys, Juan back here today with a brand new video and as always very excited to be here sitting with you guys to talk about more sports creative content. If you guys follow me on Instagram, you guys probably saw that I put up a couple stories over the last few weeks just to get some questions from you guys about anything related to the sports creative world, my career so far, what I'm doing, my life, etc, etc. So that's exactly what this video is, is my first Q&A on this channel. I picked out my favorite questions from that list and I'm going to answer them right here for you guys. So without further ado, let's get to the first question. How did you turn sports videography into full-time work from, and I'm sorry if I pronounce anyone's name wrong, this is from Kosuki Fitness, or yeah, Kosuki Fitness is how I think you say that. So how did I turn sports videography into my full-time career? Well, I think it definitely helped that I went to school for it. I went to Ryerson here in Toronto and I took a sport media course. Originally, being a sports content creator wasn't my initial idea of what I wanted to do in this line of work. I was actually a writer before, but the way I kind of turned it into my full time job and what I'm doing right now is just by working every day and creating and consistently making new things and networking. I think the combination of kind of hustling and making something new every day combined with networking was the easiest way of, you know, not just getting my work out there, but meeting the right people to get me into the positions to find these jobs and these opportunities. And, you know, even for a little while, I, I was a freelancer, so I wouldn't necessarily call it full time, but you know, I was a freelancer for a while, but you know, I think the simple answer to that is I, I worked really hard. I continued to hone my craft. I made videos every day. I, I made different pieces of content. I learned different skills. And at the same time, I was just very actively meeting people, not just in person, but online, connecting with people on Instagram, connecting with people on Twitter, and just getting my name out there and putting my work out there, posting my work online. And you know, when the right person comes and when the right opportunity comes knocking, you have a body of work and people are able to see who you are. And you know, if you're a good person and you know, friendly, then you'll have no problem securing that job and kind of rolling your way into making this your full-time thing. I will say it does take a while. It's not something that you just do overnight. So if you do want to do this full-time, just make sure you know it's not just going to happen. You do have to really work for it. I hope that answers your question. The next question is, where do you want to be five years from now? And this is from New Light Media, which is actually my buddy Colin. So Colin, if you're watching this, shout out to you. Thank you for getting a question in here. And to answer your question where I would want to be in five years, uh, to be honest with you, this answer changes on like a bi-weekly basis or almost a weekly basis, but I'll try to give you more of a solid idea of where I want to be in the next five years. Like I just said, my kind of idea of where I want to be in the future changes very consistently, but I think that's just because I'm very open to anything that comes my way. But a goal I've always had for myself, whether it's in the next five, six, seven, 10 years, what have you, is to be a creative director of some sort or a creative producer, whether that's with a professional team or with a, you know, a NCAA college level team, I would love to run a creative team for an athletic department or a sports team and just kind of have a team underneath me and work with really talented individuals to create a team's brand and to create content surrounding, you know, whether it's one team or a whole athletic department, I, I've seen a lot of people, you know, Tyson Hutchins, is a big inspiration for me with what he does at Clemson. He runs a really talented team out there. There are so many people that kind of do that line of work. So I think definitely in the next you know five years or so, I would love to be on the path of being a creative director of some sort in some capacity at a sports organization. Like I said, whether it's a professional team or even an NCAA team. And another one might actually also be to work overseas one day with something like the Premier League. I've always wanted to work at least a year away. Uh, from North America and try something else, something different. I'm a big, I'm a big uh, soccer fan, so maybe one day work out there. So those are kind of where I would like to be in the next five years, either one or the other. But like I said, I'm very open to seeing what's coming and what's next. So I'm not gonna hold myself to those answers. I might change my mind in the next week. Like I said, what motivates you to create content? And this is from Spencer Packlin. Spencer, to answer your question, I think one of the biggest things that motivates me is just telling stories. I think I got this a lot from when I started doing content at Ryerson where I kind of got my start was a lot of that storytelling of these athletes who are so talented and you know, I really think that it's just the opportunity to get up and be able to work with these athletes one on one and, and tell their stories and showcase what they're doing. I love sports. I've always been a huge sports fan my whole life. So I think also apart from storytelling, just the opportunity to work in sports and do something I love is what motivates me. It's 
it's truly something I enjoy doing and it doesn't even feel like work. So just kind of like the love for sports and for storytelling and for the athletes that I work with on a day in and day out basis and the people who I work with too, just across the board, anywhere I've worked in the sports creative world, everyone's been fantastic. So I think it's storytelling that motivates me. I think it's just my passion for sports that motivates me. And it's the people who I work with that motivate me as well to just keep creating content and keep pushing the needle. Are you going to do design videos from Aaron Campbell? Maybe. Um, I'm going to leave that other maybe. The only reason I'm going to leave it other maybe is because, don't get me wrong, I love design as much as the next guy. And uh, it has been a very integral part of my career up to this point, kind of what I was doing for the most part for the last two and a half years at TSN Bar Down. But I, at the same time, I don't feel as qualified to talk about it as I know other people in my circle are. There are so many talented designers out there who do such an amazing job on YouTube. Bradley Jack Design is a guy that comes to mind amongst many others who have amazing tutorials. And I just think that my skill set isn't really there. So it is definitely a bit of imposter syndrome that's preventing me. But you know, maybe one day when I feel more comfortable with it, I also feel like I need to recharge a little bit from it. Um, I just moved into a new role and to a new job. So I'm just trying to get acclimated and doing something like that is a little out of what I'm aiming to do. But hopefully someday I do want to get back into the design chair and break down a few things and showcase. But my true passion honestly does lie with video. So that's going to be what I'm going to be doing for the most part here on YouTube. But I think down the road, you might convince me and you don't be surprised if you see a design video here or two. And also just because I have a lot of designer friends, I do want to bring them on and talk design on this channel. So not yet, but it'll be coming soon, hopefully. So the next question is from Lights Quinn and he's debating on getting the 70 to 200 F4 for Christmas, but he can't tell if it's the move and how I like it. Well, I'm sorry that this video is coming after Christmas. So maybe you've made your choice by now, but I'll give you kind of a couple of reasons as to why I got the 70 to 200. F4 that is. So the biggest reasons why I got it, number one, obviously price. I'm a Sony user, so the Sony 70 to 200 F4 brand new was like $1,700, $1,800. And the brand new Mark II F2.8 version of it, fact check me, editor Juan, future Juan who's doing this if I'm wrong, but I think it's like $3,200. And right now for me, a lens that's $3,200 Canadian is just not feasible for me. I've used it once or twice already because uh, I have friends who have had it and I rented it once just for fun. And it is a fantastic lens, but I think number one, the price is obviously the biggest deterrent. And number two, the F4 and the F2 are a lot bigger. Let me actually just grab my F4 to show you. So this is the F4 70 to 200 by Sony. The biggest drawback I think from the 2.8 version for me, apart from the price is just the size. It is a little bigger and a little heavier than this guy. The biggest reason that that's important for me is because I kind of want to be light and mobile. I'm not shooting on a cinema rig. I have a rig, but it's not super massive and heavy and being on foot all the time, especially if I'm shooting something like basketball or hockey, like, you don't want to have a lot weighing you down. So I think this lens is the perfect size and weight for that. The F2.8, as great as it is to have that super buttery depth of field, I don't think it's absolutely necessary. And I just the weight is kind of a turnoff and I can't keep it as stable as maybe I could this lens. They both have great features. This has steady shot, you know, it's a solid built lens. And to be completely honest, I never really shoot sports at 2.8. The only time I ever do is when I'm using my 28 to 75, but that's when I have a bit of a closer distance. So I feel like it would be a lot harder to get focus with the 2.8. I could be wrong, but that's just my reasoning. The price, it's a little bit bigger and heavier, and I'm also shooting on the Sony a7S III, so shooting in low light isn't a big concern of mine. So. If you're shooting in low light environments and don't have a good low light camera, like the a7S III or any of the other Sony cameras, maybe then it is more feasible for you to get the 2.8, but being on this system, I can kind of push my ISO a little more and survive with the F4 aperture. So that's why I stuck with this one. Let me know what you got if it's too late. I know, like you said, it was Christmas, but let me know. But I do want to make a more in-depth video in the future, so I'm really glad you asked that question. That is on my future videos list is why I got the F4 over to the 70 to 200, so that's to be coming soon. All right, what we got next? Best way to go full-time freelancing from Mags Films. I am probably not the person to ask this question because I 
technically have been freelancing for a while, but I wouldn't consider myself full-time freelance because when I was working with MLSE and TSN, I was technically on a freelance situation, but I'd be working on a part-time schedule. So I don't think I've ever really truly experienced what it's like to work full-time freelance, if that makes sense. So the next question by Who's Olo, he actually asked two, so I'm just gonna put them into one. He asked first, what are your thoughts on After Effects? And then after learning After Effects fully, what should I try to learn next? So I think After Effects is really, really important for any kind of creative to learn. And I think honestly for sports, it's definitely something you should add to your rep repertoire for so many reasons. And that's just, this program is insanely powerful. The amount of VFX you can do in this program alone is like literally movie level stuff. Like they use this in the professional industry to do special effects and everything along those lines. There is so much to do. I use mostly Premiere Pro for my editing, but anytime I do special effects, say I'm adding clones of somebody or doing some specific transition that you can't do in Premiere Pro, I am most of the time probably switching over to After Effects to complete that heavier render work. There are a few examples where I've used After Effects heavily and I'll throw them on screen now, but anytime you've seen me, you know, duplicate guys or do zoom transitions or visor transitions or anything like that, all done in After Effects and I've only really scratched the surface of what you can do in After Effects. There are so many good tutorials out there. I definitely suggest diving deep into it. I haven't even divin, divin as, divin, is divin even a word? I haven't taken a dive as deep as I would want into that program and I'm planning on to. I literally just discovered content aware fill today, like by the time this video comes out, probably a couple days from now, but like the day I shot this video, I discovered content aware fill and I, so I'll throw it up here. I just messed around with this clip of Connor McDavid and I made him disappear and reappear. I never knew you could do that. I just discovered it. And there's so many things that you can do it for. It's great for tracking. It's great for animating text. There's so many uses for After Effects. So I think it's super important and pretty much every sports creative should have a basic understanding of it and then dive deeper to get those little nuances. There's so much you could learn. I think I could use After Effects for the rest of my life and still not know the surface level of that program. As to what to learn after, maybe Cinema 4D. I don't have a big interest in 4D work, uh, but I think that's a very good place next step to do. But I think you'll be learning After Effects and stuck there for a while, but you know, it's a lot of fun. You'll get to do some really cool stuff in it. So I definitely recommend to you and to anybody else who hasn't tried it yet, definitely get into After Effects a little bit, mess around. You will learn so much and you'll add a little bit more spice to your work that is just a really good cherry on top for some things. Next question from Chris Ray Media. What is the best picture profile for the a7 III? So Chris, I don't own the a7 III and I never have. I have the a7S III right now. And before this one, I had an a6300. I still have it, but I just don't use it as much. So I can't necessarily speak for the a7 III, but I used HLG on the a7S III at times, which I know is available on the a7 III, and I think it's a great picture profile. It's a great flat picture profile. You can definitely color grade. It gives you a little bit more dynamic range than just using it in standard. When I had my a6300 as my primary camera, I definitely shot a lot in, oh, what's that called? Why, why can't I remember the picture profile? Cine 4. I used to shoot a lot in Cine 4. Pretty much everything on my a6300 was shot in Cine 4. I wouldn't recommend shooting anything like S-Log 2 or 3 on an 8-bit camera like the a7 III. Like right now I'm shooting this all on S-Log 3. So I can take away the color grade and you can see how flat this is. But the thing is I'm shooting on a 10-bit camera right now. So there's a lot more room for me to play with, which you can't really do on an 8-bit camera. So I think HLG, I think HLG 2 and 3 is what I've used before. Both super solid, very minor difference between the two. And then Cine 4 is something I used for so long. Very similar to HLG, it's more of a flatter profile. There's still a little bit of saturation and contrast in there, but not as much as your standard profile. Those two profiles are pretty good. You're just gonna kind of play around and figure out which one you like best. The next question I'm really excited to answer from Z Wilson, he asks, how would you go about networking with any professional leagues without a degree? Fantastic question. This is something I really wanted to talk about, so I'm glad you asked it. And I'm gonna make a whole separate video to this topic one day because it's really important. And that's just to kind of answer the question of, do you need a degree to work as a sports creative? And my initial answer is no. Now, now I have to recognize and admit, I do have a degree in a sport media program here in Toronto from Ryerson. I did my five years, I got my degree, I learned a lot. 
but I don't necessarily think that's the biggest reason why I've gone work or why anyone would get work in the creative field, specifically in sports. I think it's just as important, if not more, to have a really strong portfolio showcasing your best work, showcasing what you're capable of, that you're a flexible creative, that you can do different things in this sphere, whether it's photography, videography, et cetera. I think also just being a genuine person helps so much in this world. Just, you know, you can be as talented as you want, but if you're just a jerk, you're not gonna get many opportunities. So I think it's just a combination of having a really strong portfolio, showcasing that you really wanna work hard, that you wanna learn, and that you wanna create the best content possible can go a lot further than having a degree. However, in my experience, at times it is handy to have. And in general, my advice to anybody who's thinking about going to university or debating on whether to do, you know, go there or to college or whatever, I would still do it. I think it's important to have a degree just in case. It is hard to find a job in the sports creative world just from my experience and seeing other people's experiences. But at the same time, it's not a make it or break it thing. And when it comes to networking, like I said, you just gotta be a good person. You gotta be easy to talk to, showcase your work, showcase that you wanna learn and you won't have any problem, whether it's you know with a high school team or even up to a professional league or team, you won't have a problem and you don't necessarily need a degree. So I hope that answers your question. Definitely a topic I'm gonna come back to. So thanks again, Z Wilson, for asking that question. The next question is from Jalen Jones and he asks, what is the best course for teaching sports photo and video? This is a really good question too. I never took a course for anything sport video or photo related. I know I just said I went to school for sport media, but we were only taught the basics of how to use a camera. I didn't know anything about gimbals. I didn't know anything about aperture. I didn't know anything about creating a rig from school. I learned everything about that and my limited knowledge of photography. And trust me, photography and videography are different, but I learned all that through YouTube pretty much 95% of my knowledge for content creation comes from YouTube University. I did take an editing course in university that helped me a little bit, but most, if not all of my skills were initially learned and honed through people on YouTube. This is probably the best resource. I call it YouTube University for a reason. So many talented people out here who are willing to give out so much information. There's even a couple sports creatives here on YouTube that are doing such a good job beyond the game TV, my buddy, Peter Sorellis, Pete Gottschalk from the MLB, a couple guys on here who give really good info and in-depth you know, conversations and they talk about gear and they're great resources to learn. Ty Rogers is another guy you wanna look into. He used to do a lot of stuff for Michigan football and is now doing DP work in LA. He's a big inspiration for me. He actually released a sports video editing masterclass. So I'll link everyone I just mentioned from Peter, Beyond the Game TV and Pete. There's two Peters there, I just realized, but I'll link all of them down as well as Ty Rogers' work. And his masterclass is something I purchased very early on and I learned a lot from it. Uh, even though I knew some of the concepts, I still picked up a decent amount of stuff. So there are courses out there. There are people who showcase and teach you sports content related things, but I'm not gonna lie to you. If you just take the time to go on YouTube and learn the basics of videography and you know photography, you can apply that to so many other things. So. I'll link everyone down in the description below. I hope that answers your question. What lens would you get with the A6400 for youth sports by CC Fisherman? Without a doubt, and I'll just say this right off the rip, is the 18 to 105 by Sony. Hands down, the most versatile lens for a crop sensor camera I've ever used. I had one for like the last three years, up until like last week when I sold it to somebody right before Christmas. Only reason I sold it is because I don't use my A6300 anymore. So the lens was just kind of gathering dust. So I figured someone else can make a lot better use of it. But I used that lens for the better part of three years shooting on that camera. And it was up until I got my 70 to 200, the lens I used 90% of the time. I love that thing to death. It gives you really wide angle at 18. It lets you punch into 105. Excellent, excellent piece of glass. I'll link it down in the description below. Without a doubt, if you're just starting off with that my, uh, that camera, it is the Sony 18 to 105 f4. Without a doubt, and we have made it to the end of the Q and that does it for this Q and A. Thank you guys so much for watching. If you've made it up to this point, if you're one of the people to ask a question, thank you so much. I really appreciate it because obviously this video would not have happened without you. If you guys ever have any more questions, feel free to ask me down in the comments below of this video, or even feel free to try to DM me on Instagram. I try to be as accessible as I can. So feel free to reach out with any questions. I'm more than happy to try and help out. 
If you guys don't follow me on Instagram, it's at 77 Morales. Same thing goes for TikTok and Twitter. If you guys enjoyed this video, make sure to like it down below. And obviously, if you're new here and you enjoy this content and you haven't subscribed, please make sure to do so down below. And that brings us to the end of this video. And as always, I will see you guys in the next one. Peace.